Hey, everybody. It's Monday, October 16th, 2023. Welcome to the NFL Fantasy Football Show presented by Subway. It's me, your man, MG Marcus Grant, joined by Michael F. Florio. We got specialists in the house. Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you so much for helping us put this show on, and thank you out there for engaging with us. However it is, whether it's audio, whether it's video, whether it's social media, whatever, we appreciate you being here. Um, This was a not a fun week of fantasy football. Not a lot of points, a lot of guys getting hurt. It, it was a very weird week all around. Just like great teams losing to bad teams. It it was kind of, we said that about last week too. Right. So the last two weeks kind of two to forget. Yeah, uh, we no longer have any undefeated teams in the National Football League with both the 49ers and Eagles losing. Uh, and it's just a whole lot of weirdness. We will have our biggest takeaways from week six. Top performers, biggest disappointments, and Matt Okada will join us a little bit later to give us some of his waiver wire targets. But let's start, as we always do, with some fantasy headlines. And injuries were the big story for the 49ers. A couple of big ones, Christian McCaffrey and Debo Samuel, both left the game as the Niners ended up losing to the Cleveland Browns. Now, we wait to see how serious they are. Debo had an x-ray on his shoulder. That was negative. An MRI is coming. McCaffrey had an oblique injury. He came back in for a play or two and then left to go to the locker room. So, at this point, if you have one of those guys, you are probably looking for some backup options. Who are the waiver wire targets you might be looking at? Jordan Mason would be the top running back that I'm interested in right now. He played more snaps than Elijah Mitchell, had more carries, more yards, scored a touchdown. But I do think Elijah Mitchell is worth uh, targeting as well because I don't think one single back replaces McCaffrey. Hopefully he is able, though, to suit up this week. From the passing game, I don't think there's a wide receiver there that I really want to pick up. Yeah, I mean, I think the next man up is probably Jawan Jennings, but I don't know that he's going to get enough love uh, to really make it worthwhile. I do wonder if Debo is out, does this mean George Kittle sort of comes back to life? Because aside from the one big game he had with the three touchdowns against the Cowboys, George Kittle really hasn't offered much in fantasy. I think he's got three or four games with fewer than five fantasy points. So if Debo can't go, maybe this means George Kittle gets some of those short targets and gets a whole lot more work uh, in the passing game. Brandon Ayuk will just keep being awesome. Well, he's going to keep eating. Brandon Ayuk <laughs> is just going to eat. Like That, I think, has been well established uh, at this point. Meanwhile, in Chicago, Justin Fields suffered a hand injury to his right hand, uh, a dislocated thumb in the game against the Vikings. Now, the good news is there are no fractures. Uh, X-rays were negative. He will have an MRI also on Monday to determine if there's any additional damage. Tyson Bajent came in, and I think the first play he had, he got blitzed and sacked, fumbled, and scooped and scored. Uh, it was all bad for him. I would put that on him. It just... Nobody blocked for him on that play. But can we trust D DJ Moore if it's Badgett that's at quarterback for this team? I watch a lot of football, and when Badgett, Badgett came in, I was like, who? <laughs> right. um, but, yeah, I, I think you don't have a choice. Like, the Bears next week at the Raiders, that is not a matchup that you're going to to being avoiding. Uh, there's six teams on by next week because... There was only two this week. Why not make it four and four? But yeah, right. six teams on by. We we keep talking about the injuries that continue to pile up right now. I just don't see a league where, unless you're in a very shallow league, I find it hard to believe that you have a better option than DJ Moore sitting on your bench. Yeah, I mean, 12-team leagues, it's certainly deeper than that. You, are, you can't really get away from DJ Moore. Even in 10-team leagues, depending on your situation, you might not be able to get away from him. Um, let's just hope that in the week to come, if Justin Fields can't go, Badgett gets enough work, that he somehow builds a rapport with DJ Moore and they start getting the football to him more consistently. Uh, it was good to see Darnell Mooney kind of get involved a little bit uh, on Sunday as well. But, you know, who knows how deep this passing game is going to go or if they you know, trust him to throw the ball a lot at all. We will find out. More injury news. We knew that Anthony Richardson was already out. Gardner Minshew got the start against the Jaguars. He did not look good. But there are reports that Richardson is considering having surgery on his shoulder, which would end his season. Now, the good news is there are reportedly no torn ligaments in the throwing shoulder. But in terms of whether he wants to just rest and see how it heals up or just go on and get it fixed, uh, we still sort of are waiting to find out. So in that case... Should we still be holding on to Anthony Richardson if you are? 
Uh, watching that video hurts my heart so much. Like, Anthony Richardson was my guy at the quarterback position. I have a lot of teams with Richardson this year. Uh, if you have an IR spot, easily hold on. Yeah. If you're in a two-quarterback format, I would hold on. Even at one quarterback, I guess it depends on the rest of your team. If you have a lot of other injuries, you can go ahead and get rid of him. But I think I would try to hold on until we get word that he is officially undergoing this surgery. Because then you could let him go. But if he ends up coming back and right. playing football again, I want him on my fantasy. Somebody's going to snatch him up if you put him out there on the waiver wire. And there's even a slight chance that he's going to come back. I guess this is more an advertisement for why you should have an IR spot in your fantasy league. If you don't have him in your league, you beg your commissioner, harass the commissioner, and get yourself an IR spot. So you can just put him there, and then you can hold on to him. And it's all good there. So there it is. All right. So those are the headlines. Now we got the things that we learned. Our biggest takeaways from week six. Uh, we have a couple each, and you're staying in Indianapolis for your first one. Yeah, the Colts running backs with Gardner Minshew are going to get targeted a whole bunch. And that's something that I wasn't banking on with Anthony Richardson because he can run. He also has a laser of an arm and could throw downfield. Like, he could throw 50 yards while falling down. So he's not going to be looking to dump it off all the time. But Minshew will be. Yesterday, Zach Moss played 49% of the snaps to 43%. They both had just seven carries for Moss, eight carries for Taylor. It did not matter. Seven targets for Zach Moss, 25 routes, six targets, 21 routes for Jonathan Taylor. I think these are two backs, Marcus, that you could just keep starting moving forward. Like, I do think we will eventually get to the point where Taylor overtakes too much of the work and Moss is not someone you feel great starting. But until we get there, keep starting both of these yeah, guys. Yeah, just keep starting both of them. I do know yesterday, I think game script kind of got away from Indianapolis. They fell behind kind of big and at some point had to kind of abandon running the football and Minshew just was on the struggle bus yesterday throwing three interceptions so uh you know that I think had an impact but it is you know I think it's interesting that I think Minshew was going to work those guys into the passing game for me Drake London is back and like kind of Kyle Pitts too it's been amazing the last few weeks I, you know we go back to week one when Drake London had one target and no catches since then he's been targeted at least six times in every game, had the huge game this past week uh, against Washington where he went over 100 yards. Meanwhile, Kyle Pitts has had six or more targets in three of his last four games. He had a touchdown this week after having the 11 targets last week. So finally, it looks like, I, I don't know if, you know, Arthur Smith has been shamed into it or if he just <laughs> came to this decision on his own. I don't care, but the targets are going to the main pass catchers. The last two weeks, between Drake London and Kyle Pitts. They've had more than 45% of the targets. They've had nearly 60% of the air yards. So it's finally looking like what we wanted. Like Bijan Robinson still getting his targets as well. So all the playmakers finally getting involved. You know, we're seeing less of Mac Holland. You know, they traded for Van Jefferson. I think he had two targets. So like the offense is looking the way we want it to. I, I hope he sticks with this. Cause like, you know, look, I, I know they're not winning. So I hope he doesn't just oh. abandon this, but you know, it's looking good right now. Arthur Smith is Cersei and, and this podcast, me and you were like Rebecca, Shame. just walking behind her. Shame. So, so, yeah, but Shame. It, it's not like we're doing this just because we have a personal vendetta against them. We're like, these two guys are very good at football. Please just throw them the ball. And it's worked. It's worked. Uh, you know, it's funny because they didn't, uh, you, the next thing is to get Kyle Pitts more yards. I, you know, I saw the stat last week that uh, when Pitts has 80 or more receiving yards, they're 6-0. and uh, he only had 43 yards this week, so you just got to bump that number up a little bit, and maybe that they, will help your chances. They also lost at home, which now Desmond Ritter, we can stop saying that he's never lost at home. <laughs> right. And now maybe we actually, you know, maybe get that quarterback change if he doesn't start playing get little, better. Get a, get a little Taylor Heineke action in there. I think we'd be okay with that. You know, F it. Drake London's down there somewhere. <laughs> um, speaking of quarterback play, uh, we had a quarterback kind of come back to earth a little bit this week. Yeah, I learned that Brock Purdy is immortal just like the rest of us. Um, <laughs> I had two weeks ago was like, hey, he's playing the Dallas Cowboys defense. Let's let's exercise caution. And then he had his best fantasy game of the year. And I was like, cool, this guy's matchup proof. We could just go <laughs> ahead and start him. And he struggled yesterday. 125 yards, one touchdown, one interception. But what worries me, look, the Browns defense is awesome. We were talking before the show. This is the first bad weather game he's played in the NFL. A lot of reasons to be like, okay, I'm going to overlook this for Brock Purdy. It's one game. What concerns me 
is the fact that Trent Williams is out. Yep. Uh, Christian McCaffrey, Debo Samuel. I've been the person a lot of the time saying like, hey, Brock Purdy on the 49ers, amazing. You take away all the weapons and everything, probably not so much. So that is something that I'm definitely keeping a close eye on moving forward. I think everybody's going to be watching to see how healthy the Niners are going into this week because that's going to have a big impact on Purdy and a lot of guys. Uh, you know, and just that whole offense and who you're starting because, uh, you know, losing players always stinks. When you're losing your best players on offense, it's going to have an impact. I don't three, care. Three in like a quarter. Are. Yeah. I mean, it, it was just rough. Uh, for me, we spent all week debating whether it was Keontae Ingram or Amari DiMercato. Maybe the answer is none of the above. Uh, it was not great for the Cardinals' backfield. They spread the opportunities around between three different guys. I mean, you had Ingram with 10 carries, Williams with 8 carries, DiMercato played the most snaps, only had two carries. Josh Dobbs ran the ball seven times. Nobody was particularly efficient with their opportunities. And in the end, all three of those guys, all three of the running backs, turned out to be really underwhelming for fantasy. And I get the sense that's what this is going to be for the next few weeks until James Conner comes back. He was the guy getting most of the work. He was doing very well with it. And I don't know that the Cardinals are going to trust any one person to be efficient enough or productive enough to just give them a whole big workload. So um, sometimes the answer is none. And apparently that's the case uh, with the Arizona Cardinals running backs. Uh, we do have answers to some other things, including the guys who boosted you up or maybe let you down. We'll also talk some waiver wire picks coming up a little bit later on in the show. Stick around for plenty more merriment and information, all of it in one, here on the NFL Fantasy Football Show. dive into the top performers for week six heading into the monday night football game to a tongue of Iloa, continuing to put up big numbers 22 and a half points for him uh, three passing touchdowns raheem mostert aka raheem must start two rushing touchdowns also a receiving score 34.2 points as he ran over the panthers amon ross st brown big day 12 catches a buck 24 and a touchdown that was good for 30 plus points travis kelsey Going back to Thursday night, nine catches, 124 yards, 21, almost 21 and a half points for him. Justin Tucker made six field goals. That was good for 18 points. And the Vikings defense going against the Bears, five sacks, three takeaways, a touchdown score, gave up 13 points. That was good for 21 fantasy points. Let's uh, break this down with some of the guys that maybe were on the list and some of the guys who maybe were just off the list of top performers. And uh, Tyree Kill, uh, had a lot of great things he did. Maybe the best thing he did was take a selfie doing a backflip, though, on Sunday. Everything he does is cool. Like, he <laughs> might be the coolest human walking the planet right now. It is insane. But I, I know some of you are out there like, oh, he won me my week. Six catches, 163 yards, and a touchdown, 28 fantasy points. Yeah, that's an average game so far for Tyreek Hill. Because he is top 28 fantasy points in four of his six games, 150 or more yards in four of his six games. He scored a touchdown in five of those six. He has given you double digit fantasy points in all of them. And currently, he is averaging 27 fantasy points per game and is on pace for 2,306 yards and the greatest wide receiver fantasy season like blowing out what cooper cup did two years ago it is insane right now the production on a weekly basis tyree kill is giving he us. is less than 200 yards away from a thousand and it's week six week six cheat that's, code that's like, insane how good he has been this year it was like everyone's like you left patrick mahomes there's no way you you're gonna be as good he's better yeah stats wise he is better now away from patrick mahomes which is an amazing thing to say uh, Michael Pittman Jr. continues to have a very good season, and we weren't sure what to make of Pittman or the Colts passing game. I mean, Florio mentioned Anthony Richardson with the big, strong arm, but uh, accuracy was going to be an issue. Plus, he was going to run. A lot of people, myself included, were off of Michael Pittman, but he continues to get looks and targets, and it hasn't mattered who the quarterback is. When Richardson was there, they were throwing to Pittman. When it's Gardner Minshew, they've been throwing to Pittman. So he is the bona fide wide receiver one. And by the way, Josh Downs, uh, if you haven't gone to get him, if he's out there on the waiver wire, go get Josh Downs because he's starting to get some more opportunities. But Michael Pittman uh, continues to ball out. So from a veteran receiver to a rookie who's having himself uh, quite a year right now. Yeah, Zay Flowers found pay dirt for the first time uh, yesterday this season. But what I care about is the consistent volume that he gives us and the consistent fantasy production. He is good for double-digit fantasy points every single week. But 
in six games so far this season, Zay Flowers has led the Ravens in targets four times. And specifically in the five games that Mark Andrews has played, Zay Flowers has led them in three of those five games in targets. And in just as a whole, with those two both on the field, Flowers is averaging 7.6 targets per game to 6.8 for Mark Andrews. There is a new top target in Baltimore, it looks like right now. Obviously, you're still starting Mark Andrews each and every week, but... You should be doing the same for Zay Flowers, I think, moving forward. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty much the Flowers and Andrew show. I know Beckham had a, a nice play, a couple of nice plays, but uh, he's been banged up. Rashad Bateman, yeah, it might be over for Rashad Bateman. Yeah, oh, yeah. He barely gets on the field at this point. Um, Travis Etienne has blossomed into a playmaker. I mean, we thought he could be that when he was drafted out of Clemson, but it's taken a couple of years, but now it seems like it's happening. He's had four games with at least 17 fantasy points. He's playing about 80% of the snaps, getting about 65% of the rushing attempts. And when it comes to catching the ball out of the backfield, he's pretty much it. He's got 24 targets. The next closest Jaguar running back has, I think, three. It's pretty much the Travis Etienne show there in the backfield. And he's starting to score touchdowns, four touchdowns in his last couple of games. So he's a guy that, you know, very quietly has become an RB1 for fantasy and should be in your lineup every week. Before it was like, a, hey, do I start ETN or this guy? At this point, you're starting Travis ETN. Um, that's great. There's another guy that like is looking like an RB1 right now, too, that I'm, I'm happy that he's back for us. Oh, yeah. Brees Hall is back in a big way. And two weeks ago, they came out and they were like, all right, training wheels are off. No more snap count. We're letting Brees go. And then he went off against the Broncos. And you're like, cool. It was awesome to see. But it's the Denver Broncos. They give up a career high to running backs on a weekly basis. Then he gets the Eagles, who have been the exact opposite. They had allowed the fewest yards, fewest fantasy points, all of that to running backs. Brees Hall in week six, 68% of the snaps, 12 of 16 RB carries, 23 routes, five targets, led all running backs there in receiving usage, 93 yards, a touchdown, and 20 fantasy points. By far the best performance any running back has had against the Eagles. Prior to this, it was Raheem, uh, I'm sorry, Ramondre Stevenson, who was around 14 fantasy points in week one. So Brees Hall uh, is back and potentially looking like a league winner down the stretch. Which is kind of what we were hoping for from him. Uh, you know, I know we, we knew he was dealing with the injury and they had Dalvin Cook there, but we were hoping that he would start to get that opportunity. And he has, and he's doing the most with it. Speaking of doing the most with their opportunities, Kyron Williams, who had a big day against the Cardinals on Sunday, 20 carries for 158 yards and a rushing touchdown. I think the issue for Kyron Williams, aside from the fact that he looks like he's got an ankle injury that's getting checked out via an MRI, is that Sean McVay sometimes forgets to run the football. I mean, two weeks ago, he had 25 carries against the Colts, went for 103 yards and a couple of rushing touchdowns. Last week against the Eagles, just 13 carries, still went for more than four yards a carry against that Philadelphia defense. And then the big game on Sunday, he is the guy. Yes, every once in a while, they sprinkle Ronnie Rivers in there when Williams needs to catch his breath. But this has been the Kyron Williams show. He's the reason that Cam Akers now collects his mail in Minneapolis. These, when they get him the ball, he is being productive. And this is a guy that, look, we talk about, there have been a lot of really great waiver wire pickups in the early season. Two of them are in Los Angeles between Puka Nakua and Kyron Williams. Williams has become an RB1 now, and he's a guy that I can't see how you get him out of your lineup unless you somehow have just, you know, been blessed with good running backs. Kyron Williams needs to be started pretty much every week for a lot of people. And on Puka, I've seen people yesterday be like, people were tweeting me like, oh, it's over for Puka. It's one down week, and he had a touchdown go through his hands. Just, just breathe. It's, it's going to be okay. one week, and he still saw targets. I mean, he... <laughs> Look, he still had seven, had seven targets. Like, what, why, are, why are we freaking out? It was a bad game. It happens for everybody. Well, speaking of actual disappointments in fantasy, we do have a couple. I, I, I want to believe in Damian Pierce. It's getting harder to believe in Damian Pierce. Yeah, and it wasn't to me yesterday the fact that he didn't give you, like, 3.4 fantasy points is obviously big and disappointing, but you could justify that at times by being like it was a tough matchup. Their O-line isn't completely healthy yet, but what worries me is one, for the first time all year, he lost volume, and two, he got straight up outplayed by Devin Singletary. Yesterday, 52% of the snaps went to Singletary, just 35% for Pierce. Uh, they split carries, 12 for Singletary, 13 for Pierce. It was Singletary that was running the routes and, and getting the targets. 
34 yards for Damian Pierce, 62 for Devin Singletary. It is highly, highly concerning because volume is what had been propelling Damian Pierce and keeping him in the conversation as a fantasy starter. They're on bye this week. Then they get the Panthers, which is the ultimate get-right spot. I think both of those running backs are in play in Week 8. I know we're getting ahead of ourselves here. But if you have Damian Pierce right now, I think... Uh, Outside of that one run where he took the entire like D line down to the one yard line, it's been a rough season and it was a rough game yesterday. Yeah, I just I you know, I I really believed I I drafted him in a lot of spots, but so far the early returns have not been great and it's time to get really worried because as you mentioned, Devin Singletary is starting to show up in that offense. Uh Kirk Cousins. I know he didn't have Justin Jefferson. But they were playing the Bears, and it felt like you could still at least believe that you were going to get some decent production out of Kirk Cousins. Instead, you get fewer than nine fantasy points from Kirk O'Chains. Uh, look, it was nice to see Jordan Addison get in the in the end zone, but this was not what I was hoping for for him. And I think what we're seeing is Kirk Cousins sort of turning into Kirk Cousins, right? Where you get those big blow up games, those high ceiling games, and you have games like this where the floor kind of falls out from underneath in a matchup that you feel like should be, uh, you know, a positive one. And now it makes you wonder, because the rest of the schedule gets a lot tougher over the next few weeks, can you trust Kirk Cousins without Justin Jefferson? And the answer is, I really don't know. The, the funny part about Kirk Cousins is by far his two worst fantasy games are the two that the Vikings have won. <laughs> that's, that's very true. I don't know what that means. Uh, I mean, I guess I don't have any stake in the Vikings winning or not, so I just want Kirk to, to play well. So, uh, sorry, Minnesota fans, if that, <laughs> if that hurts your potential for, uh, for winning football games. Uh, all right, let's uh, get to some of your questions, because you guys had a few that you sent to us on socialmediawebsite.com. So, uh, we'll dive into as many as we can over the next few minutes. Uh, this one coming from Houston sports fan who wants to know, what's the situation with Calvin Ridley? He's not droppable. But I cannot trust him in my lineup on a week-to-week -week basis anymore. So what are we doing with C-Rid? I think you just keep starting him. Like, I know yesterday wasn't a great fantasy game. He still led the team with eight targets. And this was in a game where they didn't have to throw the ball a whole bunch because they were up multiple scores throughout. I Like, Christian Kirk didn't have a great game either he just caught the touchdown i think with both of the jaguars guys you got to understand variance is a thing at the wide receiver position they'll be up weeks down weeks but i think you just kind of roll with the two of them i mean you just kind of have to because they're the guys who are getting most of the targets and you know it's really funny because for as frustrating as ridley is and i'm not denying that it that it hasn't been a frustrating experience he's a top 25 receiver in fantasy right now so i know it's not what you were hoping for when you drafted him i think you were probably banking on him being a little bit closer to the top 10 um, it is what it is. Uh, hopefully he can turn some things around in the second half of the season because, again, most of the targets going toward him and Christian Kirk, you got to believe at some point they're going to break through. But uh, I understand your frustration, 100%. Uh, Ginzu wants to know, is it safe to drop Di Mercado after one week? Is it okay to drop Stevenson? Now, I think these are two very different questions right here. Yeah, Di Mercado, yes. Uh, I know he was out there for the passing down stuff, but Josh Jobs doesn't really dump off as much as uh, we were hoping. Stevenson, why would you drop him now? Like, this is his best game in a month. <laughs> right? He had five catches yesterday. They started throwing him the ball again, and he gets the Bills next week, which like, I know on paper might look like a tough matchup. The Bills cannot stop the run. Uh, like, they're giving over five yards a carry. I, I think you roll with Stevenson again next week. Yeah, I think you can definitely say goodbye to Di Mercado. Um, you know, I, Keontae Ingram looked like the lead back. He got the start. Not that he was great. Like I said earlier in the show, I just don't know that you can really roll with any Cardinals running backs right now. So it's okay to get to get rid of Di Mercado. I, I mean, like Florio said, why why now? Like, if anything, maybe try to trade Stevenson, see if somebody will take him off your hands and get something in return for it. But uh, yeah, he played you know decent, all things considered. Um, by the way, the Raiders. They are a get-right pill for a lot of running backs, man. Like, A.J. Dillon went for 76 and a touchdown against the Raiders. Uh, Stevenson has 80 scrimmage yards and a touchdown. So if you got a running back that is struggling, maybe see if you can dial up the Raiders and, uh, and give them a call and let them get on the field. So, uh, I don't know. Try to move him. Pablo wants to know, should Jameer Gibbs owners abandon ship? Oh, we're pulling the shoot. No. Pablo, <laughs> look. I understand this is just like the Stevenson one. I understand there's been frustrating weeks, but why now? We just found out that David Montgomery is dealing with the rib injury and could be sidelined for a couple of weeks. 
if anything, they're gonna have to start giving Jameer Gibbs the ball. No, I'm 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 never gonna be at the point where I think where I'm ready to drop Gibbs. Certainly not now. I mean, it's just so much talent, you yeah. know, there. And, that, and, like, now with Montgomery being gone, the opportunity should hopefully arise. So, uh, yeah, I, I, again, I understand. Don't say, don't, don't think I don't understand, but I, I don't know that you pull a shoot now, especially because uh, a spot might be opening up. Last one. Lewis wants to know, should I worry about Puka? No. No. They, no. Threw, they threw the ball 24 times yesterday. <laughs> Cooper Cup and Puka had 16 of those. Like, it, it is a two-man passing game. And if Puka holds on to that touchdown, we're, we're celebrating him again today. Look, Cooper Cup is amazing. He is, outside of Tyreek Hill, probably the best wide receiver on the uh, healthy right now. But Puka's going to be just fine. Puka's had one, like, down game. That's it. Like, why are we worrying about Puka all of a sudden? No, we're not worried about Puka. He's fine. Just hold on. Keep starting him. It'll get better. Please. Uh, in case you are worried, though, and I want to make some moves, we got the waiver wire coming up. Matt O'Connor will join us to talk about some guys that you might want to consider adding on your fantasy roster this week. That's next on the NFL Fantasy Football Show. It's time for the waiver wire presented by YouTube TV. This is a list compiled by Matt Okada. A couple of quarterbacks up top, Sam Howell and Joshua Dobbs. A lot of running backs. Chuba Hubbard getting more opportunities there in Carolina, especially with Miles Sanders injured. Uh, Elijah Mitchell, Jordan Mason to watch in San Francisco because of the injury to Christian McCaffrey. Daily double in Chicago with Deontay Foreman and Roshan Johnson. Meanwhile, Craig Reynolds. Uh, they're in Detroit with David Montgomery banged up. Kareem Hunt got a lot of opportunities for Cleveland on Sunday. And there's da Damian Williams and Keontae Ingram, who look like the top two choices down in Arizona. Then there's Ezekiel Elliott over in New England. Over to the wide receivers. Deontay Johnson looking to get back soon from injured reserve. Should uh, check to see if he's still out there on your waiver wire. Wandale Robinson getting more run for the Giants. Josh Downs getting a lot of love in Indianapolis. There's Kendrick Bourne in New England, K.J. Osborne in Minnesota. Rasheed Rice looks like he's establishing himself in Kansas City. Jackson Smith and Jigba for the Seahawks had one of his best games of the season. Tyler Boyd in Cincinnati and Curtis Samuel in Washington is a thing. Everybody jump in now. And the tight ends, Logan Thomas for the Commanders. Jake Ferguson uh, with the Dallas Cowboys. They are on a bye, but maybe time to go stash him right now. Cade Otten. Getting some love, hopefully, fingers crossed, down there in Tampa Bay. Luke Musgrave, hopefully back out of concussion protocol. And Michael Mayer starting to get some work with the Las Vegas Raiders. Time now to bring in the guy who writes our waiver wire column every single week. It's Matt Okada. You can check it out, of course, at NFL.com slash waiver wire. And uh, Okada, this is a big week for waivers because we got six teams on a bye. The Panthers, the Bengals, the Cowboys, the Texans, the Jets, the Titans all have the week off. Why the league couldn't have just made it four and four instead of going two and six, I don't know. That's above my pay grade. Uh. Right? Uh, but let's just, let's just get going with the quarterbacks because Sam Howell – I don't know how he does it. I don't know how he's scoring all these fantasy points, but every week he seems to be scoring a lot of fantasy points. So I guess we should just stop asking why and just kind of enjoy the moment. Yeah, I mean, I think the a nice thing about it is he's doing it in a bunch of different ways. He's done it with yards. He's done it with his legs. This last week he did it with touchdowns through three of them. And he's been good pretty much all year. He's averaged 276 yards and two TDs per game since week four hit 18 plus fantasy points in four of his last five he is the qb 12 overall in the season despite posting what was essentially a zero in week three against the bills so if you take that out he's been great and he's got a pretty relatively fantasy friendly schedule coming up over the next few weeks including the giants and the eagles who sound scary but aren't bad for fantasy quarterbacks and he's got a really good receiving core as frustrating as their usage might be it's working out for him. I think he's a viable stream in most matchups and an every week starter in two QB leagues or deeper leagues. Completely agree with you there. And yet, Matt, yesterday, Chuba Hubbard went out and had more fantasy points than Miles Sanders has had in all but one game this season. But they're on bye next week. But that's not scaring you off. You're saying still go out and add Chuba Hubbard this week. Yeah, listen, beggars can't be choosers these days, Florio. We got to get running back somehow, and if it means tucking one away when he's on on the team's bye, I'm willing to do it. Like you said, Hubbard, 19 carries, 88 yards this past week, including a touchdown. Both of those numbers were better than Sanders' season highs through the first five weeks. Hubbard took 76% uh, 76 
of Carolina snaps, which is basically bell cow territory. So if Sanders is still out when they come back from their bye, Hubbard is a locked and loaded play. If Sanders comes back, at the very worst, Hubbard is a really solid, you know, stash, handcuff type player. But given the fact that he's been more efficient than Sanders all year, I'm not convinced that they don't start to lean more towards Hubbard as the lead guy. And if they do that, he's got 15 touch upside, and that is really all he can ask these days out of a fantasy, a healthy fantasy running back. I mean, yeah, even before the Sanders injury, you could see Hubbard just sort of closing the gap in terms of snaps and, and touches and that sort of thing. So I, I think that just continues to even after the bye. Uh, in San Francisco, obviously a healthy Christian McCaffrey is the guy, but he's not completely healthy. At least he wasn't on Sunday. So uh, it's a daily double, either Elijah Mitchell or Jordan Mason. Is there one that you maybe prefer more than the other? There is, and I'm pretty sure daily doubles are supposed to mean extra money for all of us. I don't know <laughs> if that was the case here. We would probably riot if CMC missed this time. I prefer Elijah Mitchell, and it's not cut and dry because Jordan Mason is the bigger back, which means he's more likely to get early down and goal line type work, and he did have more opportunity and snaps and touches on Sunday when CMC went out. However, Elijah Mitchell was just coming back from an injury, and Mason is a special teams guy who's gonna get work regardless and has never been a starter. Elijah Mitchell, for those who forget, back when he was a rookie, he started 10 games, he averaged 15 fantasy points a game. He was the RB 15 in points per game that year. I think Shanahan might rotate these guys, but if I'm gonna pick one, it's Mitchell. You should probably look at picking up both if CMC is gonna be out. Another backfield with two backs here is in Chicago with uh, their, their dual running backs there. But we were talking about earlier on the show, the Raiders have been a get-right spot for running backs all year long, and that's, that's who the Bears get next week. So how excited should we be for the Chicago duo? Yeah, I'm decently excited potentially about both. Last week in the column, I said I preferred Roshan Johnson over Deontay Foreman. But Johnson was in concussion protocol. He didn't clear. Foreman got the start and was decent against the Vikings, 65 yards on 15 carries. I think Johnson should clear the protocol and be back for that matchup with the Raiders, that get-right game. If that's the case, I would add him, rank him, and start him ahead of Foreman. I think he has more upside. He's more versatile. But that being said, I'm willing to also roll Foreman out there or at least have him on the roster to see how things pan out. This is a bit of a moving part situation because Justin Fields is also injured. He dislocated his thumb. So pay attention to the news. Listen to Marcus and Florio. Keep your ears open. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I look, I like Deontay Foreman this week because there was no Rashawn Johnson. I think he still has some upside potentially. But if Johnson's back, everything points to him sort of being the guy uh, in the backfield to get the first crack at things. Uh, in New York, been very happy to see Wandale Robinson sort of work into the offense. He's had five targets in every single game, uh, five or more, I should say, in every single game, even if they are sort of short, extended handoff sort of targets. Uh, but they had the big game on Sunday night against the Buffalo Bills with 62 receiving yards. Uh, one, uh, are we really in on Wandale Robinson? And two, can we start a petition to make Tyrod the quarterback? Because he seemed to get all the pass catchers involved. <laughs> Uh, I would sign that petition, first of all. <laughs> Second of all, yes, I'm in on Wandale. You might remember I've been in on Wandale for like almost a month now. I told everybody to stash him a long time ago. And the giant chickens came home to roost this past Sunday night. Uh, eight catches on eight targets. Both of those were team highs, 62 yards. Since returning from his knee injury in week three, he has drawn a target on 28% of his routes that is stud territory and he has an 88 percent catch rate on those targets and i think he continues to progress in both involvement and evolution as a player i think he will demand more routes more opportunities more utilization downfield which should improve his efficiency and i think he has really all the makings of a target vacuum ppr friendly kind of asset sort of like victor cruz of old once brian dable recognizes this and starts involving him as he should be in this offense he could be the wide receiver one i just want to see him break out the salsa dance if he scores a <laughs> touchdown that, now that's yes. all I, I want out of him uh okada another wide receiver kj osborne yesterday felt kind of like the floor for him but one thing that we were talking about earlier is the vikings their worst fantasy games come when they win they get the niners next week not so sure they're gonna win so better days ahead for kj 
Yeah, absolutely. I think this was a hundred percent game script. It was about a quarter and a half in, and he had four catches for forty-eight yards. And I was like, "Hurrah! We have a decent <laughs> backup for Justin Jefferson, and we're going to get good fantasy output from Osborne." He finished with four catches for forty-eight yards, which was incredibly frustrating. The Vikings just stopped throwing. Cousins threw, I think, thirty-one passes in the game, and he topped forty-four in most of the previous games of the year. I expect Minnesota to get back to a more fantasy-friendly game script moving forward. But in that game against the Niners, where they're likely to be trailing, there are going to be a lot of targets to go around. And Osborne is probably like the 1B or 1C behind Hawkinson alongside Addison. All those guys are going to get involved. And I think Osborne is going to be fantasy useful for as long as Jefferson is out. So we got KJ Osborne kind of pairing up with uh, Jordan Addison in Minnesota. Meanwhile... Over in Las Vegas, I mean, this was supposed to be the year of the rookie tied in, but Dalton Kincaid has been underwhelming as he's splitting time with Dawson Knox. Sam Laporte has been amazing. Michael Mayer had been just a ghost. I mean, he had two targets all season long until a couple of weeks ago. Last week, he had three targets. On Sunday, six targets turned it into 75 receiving yards. So can we trust now that Michael Mayer is emerging, that he's here to, to come and play for that Raider offense? Uh, trust might be a strong word, Marcus. Let's not get ahead of ourselves here. He's, he's still a rookie tight end. And to your point, yes, this was an exciting draft class, but you shouldn't expect much more than what Mayer did over the first month of the season. Sam Laporta is not the norm. Do not look to that for the archetype here. What we have seen is over the last two weeks, McDaniels and the Raiders offense have made a point of getting Michael Mayer involved, and he has capitalized like you said, 75-yard performance in Sunday's win. And what I've noticed most is he is a extremely consistent chain mover. Six of his eight catches have gone for first downs. He's kind of annoyingly doing a lot of what Devontae Adams should be doing for this offense, and that likely corrects itself, so Devontae will probably bump back up to take some of this work from Mayer. But with how good he's looked, if he continues to get this kind of involvement, he might be a streamable option, so I'd tuck him away on your bench if you can. Have him for the stretch. You talk about tucking some guys away. Uh, normally, I know you guys, you have your guys to stash. Is there anybody out there that people should maybe try to get ahead of the curve on right now? Uh, I will say a couple tight ends that I like are Kate Otten and Luke Musgrave. Both of them are decent streams this week, and both of them have upside down the stretch. Beyond that, uh, we mentioned Rasheed Rice on the full screen uh, on the list of guys. He looks like he is... and. We've said this before, <laughs> maybe stepping up into that true wide receiver one role in Kansas City. I said it last week. He had a good week. I think it continues to progress for Rasheed. He has an opportunity to be the guy, and that would be huge for fantasy. I will admit that uh, it's become a perverse little game for me to figure out which Chiefs receiver is going to go off in any given week. And Rasheed Rice might be taking that away from me in, in the very near future. Who knows? Uh, but we'll see. But uh, Matt, as always, appreciate it, man. Have everybody go check him out at Matt Okada on Twitter and go read the article at NFL.com slash WaverWire. Always appreciate it, Matt. We will talk to you next week. In the meantime... We've had a whole full show of things and a whole, oh, yeah. uh, whole lot of injury news to talk about. A whole lot of things that we're going to try to maneuver as we get a little bit later on in the week. So in the meantime, for us, that is it. We are done. We appreciate you hanging out with the NFL Fantasy Football Show presented by Subway. You know the drill. Tell two friends to tell two friends. Rate, review, and remember, the problem with the rat race is that even if you win, you're still a rat. Be safe, take care of yourselves, and we'll talk to you again real soon.